Another accessory structure that is associated with the integumentary system are sebaceous glands, oil producing glands. These are extracrine glands found in the skin. The holocrin mode of secretion is how the discharge of what we call sebum occurs. And sebum is oil produced by the sebaceous glands. Sebum contains a mixture of triglycerides, cholesterol, proteins, as well as electrolytes. It turns out that sebum can inhibit the growth of certain bacteria. It lubricates and protects the keratin of the hair shaft, as well as conditions the surrounding skin. Now, if we look at the sebaceous gland, you can clearly see that it's associated with a hair follicle. In fact, any time we have a hair follicle, there will always be sebaceous glands found associated with it. So in other words, we don't have a hair follicle without a sebaceous gland. So they come hand in hand. Now, sometimes what can occur is the sebaceous duct that leads into the hair follicle can become plugged. And when that occurs, then you have what's called acne. So this typically begins during the onset of puberty when testosterone levels start to increase. And with the increasing levels of testosterone, what we have is an increase in the activity of the sebaceous glands. So in other words, testosterone increases sebum secretion by the sebaceous glands that potentially can clog or plug up not only the sebaceous duct, but the hair follicle itself. So looking at the images down below, we have what's called a black head. And what this is, is basically um, oxidized sebum. And this is an open comedo. And you can see that the epidermis, the stratum, corneum isn't covering the hair follicle. So the sebum just gets oxidized. And when it gets oxidized, it turns black. And that's why it's referred to as a blackhead. Now, if there's a little bit of the stratum corneum that covers up the plug hair follicle, we end up with what is called a whitehead or a closed comedo. A postule is a little more serious than a blackhead and a whitehead. And as you can see here, is as this sebaceous gland continues sebum production, it's not like we can say, okay, sebaceous gland, stop secreting sebum. So it's always being secreted. So the more secretions that occur, the more sebum gets plugged. So in other words, it begins to accumulate and eventually leading to a more clogged or plugged up sebaceous duct and hair follicle. And we often will have pain associated with this and as well as inflammation. And it could progress to what's called a nodule and eventually could end up with what's called cystic acne, which is the most severe type of acne. And you can see that now it's an even larger collection of not only sebum, as well as cells related to the immunity. Basically have an infection that occurs, not only in the sebaceous duct, but as well as the hair follicle. And it's an extensive inflammation. So what are some of the treatments for acne? Well, over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide, as well as salicylic acid. If the acne is severe enough, antibiotics may be prescribed, as well as vitamin A derivative products or compounds such as retin-A or retinoic acid. Uh, unfortunately, it could lead to pitting or scarring if left untreated, especially with cystic acne. I'm not expecting you to know a blackhead or a whitehead or a postule, a nodule or a cystic acne or a cyst, but please know what acne is. Another accessory structure associated with the integumentary system are the sudoriferous glands, commonly known as your sweat glands. Just like the sebaceous gland, the sudoriferous glands are exocrine glands in the skin. However, Rather than a holocrine mode of secretion with the sebaceous glands, with these pseudoriferous glands, it's merocrine mode of secretion. Well, we have two types of pseudoriferous glands. We have the apocrine sweat glands and the merocrine or eccrine sweat glands. So if we look at these two images, we can see that the apocrine sweat gland is also associated with the hair follicle. So when it produces sweat, it will be discharged into the hair follicle, just like the sebaceous gland. 
However, if we compare this with the merocrine or eccrine sweat gland, its duct does not empty into the hair follicle. Instead, it discharges the sweat directly onto the surface of the skin. So we have a little tiny pore on the surface of our epidermis called the sweat pore. And this is where the eccrine sweat is discharged onto the surface of our skin. So looking at the histology, here is your apocrine sweat gland and here is your merocrine sweat gland. So in the next slide, we're gonna look at the details of these two types of pseudoriferous glands. And the above picture, here is your apocrine sweat gland. Once again, its duct is associated with the hair follicle, so the sweat will empty into the hair follicle, just like the sebaceous glands when it produces sebum, which also empties into the hair follicle. However, with the American sweat gland, this is not the case. The duct discharges the sweat directly onto the surface of the epidermis through, once again, a tiny little pore called the sweat pore. So let's now discuss the two types of pseudoriferous glands or sweat glands in more detail. We'll start off with the apocrine sweat glands. We know that its products will be discharged into the hair follicle. Why is that? Well, it's because the duct of the apocrine sweat gland will empty into the hair follicle. Now, one thing I want to mention, that even though it's associated with the hair follicle, just like the sebaceous glands, unlike the sebaceous glands where any time we have a hair follicle, we will always have a sebaceous gland. These apocrine sweat glands, however, are only found in certain regions of the body. So in other words, just because you have a hair follicle does not necessarily mean you will automatically have an associated apocrine sweat gland. Again, this is not the case with the sebaceous gland. So where exactly do we find these apocrine sweat glands? So we find them in the armpit or the axillary region. We find them around the nipples, the pubic, and the groin regions of the body. Now, the sweat that these apocrine glands produce is not like merocrine or eccrine sweat. Instead, the sweat is rather sticky, it's cloudy or opaque, and can become potentially smelly or odiferous when it comes in contact with the bacteria on the skin and the hair. Now, because the apocrine sweat gland is associated with the hair follicle, once again in certain regions of the body, just like the sebaceous gland, there will be mixing of the sebum and the sweat produced by these apocrine sweat glands. Why? Because they both empty or their ducts empty into the hair follicle. Apocrine sweat glands do not become active until the onset of puberty. This is because testosterone will essentially make them active. So a young child, their apocrine sweat glands are not active. They're not yet actively producing sweat. This is why children do not have body odor because apocrine sweat glands, once again, only become active upon the onset of puberty because of testosterone. So the secretory activity of the glands is not only controlled by hormones such as testosterone, but as well as the nervous system. So with anxiety or nervousness, you can increase the production of apocrine sweat glands. The other type of sweat gland or pseudoriferous gland are the merocrine sweat glands, also called eccrine sweat glands. Now, unlike the apocrine sweat glands where we find them associated with the hair follicle in certain regions of the body, this is not the case with the merocrine or eccrine sweat glands. They are widely distributed throughout the body. Now, the sweat that they produce, the eccrine sweat, is not sticky, cloudy, and potentially can become smelly, body odor, basically. Instead, the sweat is rather watery. It's more fluid. So it's going to contain water, salts, and organic compounds. And this is responsible for what's called sensible sweat, something that we're going to look at with the next slide. Now, as far as the structure of these merocrine sweat glands, they are smaller than the apocrine sweat glands. Furthermore, they do not extend as deeply into the dermis as the apocrine sweat glands. 
we find a lot of these merocrine or eccrine sweat glands on thick skin, the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. Now, the structure of the merocrine or eccrine sweat glands is just like the apocrine. So simple coiled tubular glands are the structure of both these types of pseudoriferous glands. Just be aware that the apocrine sweat glands are larger than the merocrine sweat glands. Now, we discussed in the previous slide that the merocrine or eccrine sweat gland will discharge your product directly onto the epidermis through the sweat pore. Now, what is the function of merocrine sweat glands? Well, it cools our skin, so it's part of the thermal regulation that we discussed earlier. It also will excrete waste and electrolytes, and it will also help flush microorganisms and harmful chemicals from the skin. So the hotter we get, the more active the merocrine or eccrine sweat gland will become. In other words, the more eccrine sweat that we produce. So let's look at the histology of the merocrine and apocrine sweat gland. So I hope you can see that the apocrine sweat gland, if we look at the lumen, its diameter is far larger than that of the merocrine sweat gland. So as far as the lumen is concerned, there is a big difference. And this is why apocrine sweat glands are larger in structure than the merocrine, because the diameter of the lumen is larger or wider in apocrine sweat glands than merocrine sweat glands. So if we look at these various images, we can see the apocrine sweat gland associated with the hair follicle. Now, one thing I need you to be aware of, here is our hair follicle, but it's not showing a sebaceous gland, but we know that any time we have a hair follicle, we have to have a sebaceous gland. It's just that in this image, it did not include that sebaceous gland with the hair follicle. And of course, here is your eccrine sweat gland or merocrine sweat gland. So if we turn to this image over here, here is your merocrine sweat gland. So take note of the size of the diameter of the merocrine sweat gland. When we compare the diameter of the lumen of the apocrine sweat gland, there is a size difference. The apocrine sweat gland, once again, is larger and deeper in the dermis than the merocrine sweat glands. Before we talk about other integumentary exocrine glands, let's first talk about perspiration. We have what's called insensible perspiration and sensible perspiration. Insensible perspiration is interstitial fluid lost by evaporation through the stratum corneum. Essentially, as water evaporates from the stratum corneum. So despite the skin surface lipids and the intercellular lipids that are produced by the lamellar granules and as well as the waterproofing protein keratin, we will still lose water. We will still lose fluid through the stratum corneum. It's inevitable. Now, more fluid will be lost if there is damage to the stratum corneum. So when would that occur? Well, that would occur with burns and as well as blisters. One of the major concerns with a serious burn is not necessarily infection, it's dehydration. Another example of dehydration that's part of this insensible perspiration is if we immerse our skin in seawater. So in a hypertonic solution, after you've soaked in seawater, for example, and when you come out of the ocean or the seawater, you notice your skin is more wrinkly. And that's because of water loss, insensible water loss or insensible perspiration due to the loss of fluid, dehydration. Now, what about sensible perspiration? This is fluid that is lost due to the sweat glands producing sweat. So please remember, there is a difference between insensible perspiration, which is just dehydration or water loss through evaporation, and sensible perspiration due to the sweat produced by the sudoriferous glands. So let's now look at the other exocrine glands associated with the integumentary system. So we talked about the sebaceous gland, we talked about the two types of sudoriferous glands, the merocrine or eccrine sweat glands, and the apocrine sweat glands. Now, it turns out that the mammary glands and the ceruminous glands are modified apocrine sweat glands. So mammary glands are exclusively found in the breast and they produce milk when a mother is nursing an infant. 
Structurally speaking, mammary glands are compound alveolar or compound acinar glands. Now, the ceruminous glands are only found in external auditory meatus, in other words, our ear canal. So, ceruminous glands produces ear wax that will help protect the eardrum. So, the consistency of cerumen is stickier and tends to take on a yellowish color. So, if something manages to get into our ear canal, chances are they'll get stuck or trapped by this sticky earwax called cerumen. So once again, the mammary glands and ceruminous glands are modified apocrine sweat glands.